Dr. Marco Grunhagen. I'm the uh, Lumpkin Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship here in the School of Business, and I'm also director of our new Entrepreneurship Center here at EIU. As you may know, the Entrepreneurship Center here is named the SEED Center, which stands for Sustainable Entrepreneurship Through Education and Development. In short, we're trying to plant the seed to grow entrepreneurship in the region. Tonight's event is held during Entrepreneurship Week, a week of celebration of the entrepreneurial spirit here at EIU, which we've held for six years now, and we're very proud to host two Hallmark events this week. These events allow us to showcase the expertise and the contributions that the study of entrepreneurial ventures contributes to the local, the national, and even the global economy. This is also the sixth year that we're operating our minor in entrepreneurship, a campus-wide minor housed in the School of Business with over 70 students across the EIU campus that have chosen entrepreneurship as their minor. On Monday night, Bob Kehoe, CEO of Leverage Marketing, an online marketing company, described his journey to become the success story he is today. Tonight's event is about franchising which has become one of the preeminent engines of growth, not only for the global economy, but it has become a hallmark of the US economy. It remains one of the mainstays of local rural markets with the universal presence of franchised fast food restaurants, hotels, car repair garages, and more recently, even of franchised laundromats and funeral homes. In short, franchising is with us for the long haul and it is becoming increasingly a part of economies across the globe. And to show you evidence of that, we have a little slide here that gives you an idea of the pervasiveness of the franchise phenomenon across a number of countries. So I'll leave that up here for a couple of minutes. Academic research on franchising goes back for over four decades, and increasingly the entrepreneurial components of franchising have received attention both in academia and in industry. It is no secret that the founding franchisors, such as Ray Kroc or Dave Thomas, were entrepreneurs through and through. Similarly, many franchisees show entrepreneurial traits as they grow their businesses and come up with new, innovative ideas. We have here tonight a panel of five experts who are going to offer their perspectives on franchising from a variety of vantage, vantage points. The idea of the panel is to provide insights into franchising from the perspectives of the franchisor, which is the company behind the system, the franchisee, the owner of the individual units, and one of the players that become part of the equation at various points throughout the life of a franchise, the state regulatory agency. So to, to represent these angles, tonight we have with us, and I'm going here from your left to your right, Daryl Fisher, who's the Vice President of Franchise Operations at Midas International in Chicago. Cassandra Helm, the Assistant Attorney General and Head of the Franchise Bureau in the state of Illinois. Jim Severson, franchise owner of a Hampton Inn, a Holiday Inn, and a Marriott Hotel up in Chicago. And Monty Sheehan, a franchise owner of the local Dairy Queen in Mattoon. Some of you guys may be familiar with her unit. We also brought in a moderator, one of my valued franchise colleagues, Dr. Steve Michael from the University of Illinois. Steve and I are part of the same tight-knit circle of franchise scholars, and our friendship goes back a number of years. And Steve is one of the most recognized academics in the field of franchising research. He received his PhD in business economics from Harvard. He's a professor of entrepreneurship and strategy in the Department of Business Administration at the University of Illinois. And I'm excited to have him here with us tonight as a moderator for this panel. So with that, I'll hand it over to Steve to take it from here. Thank you very much and good evening. Before we get started, I do want to thank the Lumpkin School, the Lumpkin Chair, and the uh, faculty and staff here at Eastern Illinois University for sponsoring this important event during Entrepreneurship Week. Franchising is a method of doing business, as Marco has outlined, that's been fabulously successful around the world. The mechanics of this are relatively straightforward when a franchise or develops and sells a production system 
a method, a recipe, a way of doing things, plus an effective marketing and brand image that he or she has established. Dairy Queen, Hilton, Holiday Inn, all those illustrate both of those principles. There's an art to making a blizzard. There's an art to making a bed. There's an art to fixing a muffler. And of course, those great brand names are known to each and every one of you as part of the economy. So the franchise is established by a contract, a legal contract. In other words, the franchisee is not an employee, but is in fact a contract that has established, is a con is a, has created a contract with the franchisor. So it's a relationship of legal independence, but economic and strategic interdependence. And that's important to remember. So it's a decision that is legal ramifications. It's a decision that has operational ramifications. And it's a decision that has strategic ramifications. Whether you choose to purchase a franchise and become a part of someone's system, or you yourself have an idea for a great sandwich, a fabulous funeral home, that might, in fact, be something that you could use that recipe, that production technology, and try to establish a brand name to bring to the service economy your entrepreneurial idea. So with that as a backdrop and a brief introduction to what franchising is, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to take a moment and speak to what he or she sees as big advantages that they've had with their experiences with the franchise system and within their own chain, and of course, from the standpoint of the state, the troubles and the successes that she has seen in her office at the Attorney General. Now, before they begin with those comments, I do want to invite you to say this is a participatory session. It doesn't necessarily look that way, but it is. I, Elise and Suzanne, in the back there, will be roaming through the audience periodically to pick up the cards that you have each been given. And you're invited to hand them cards, and I will be asking the questions to try to moderate the conversation here with the panelists. But please don't be shy. We're here to answer your questions. So please take the liberty of writing down, writing down a, a few comments, and we'd be love to have them. All right. To our distinguished panel, Daryl, what do you see as some of the key advantages and perhaps a, a challenge that franchising creates in your business? See if this is on. It is. Okay. Um, I would say the advantage that uh, I have the uh, um, pleasure of being with a company that's been in existence for 60 years this year will be our 60th year in business. And the brand has uh, been established a long time ago, Mufflers, of which is a very small portion of our business today. Um, but this generation, my generation, knows it as Midas Muffler. And it gained that recognition because, we, you know, we had the one hour, the lifetime guarantee, we really pushed exhaust when exhaust was uh, an important element. It's become a very, very small portion of the repair work on a vehicle today. So we've diversified over the years to add full service auto repair, including tires. So we become a general repair service, and the challenge that we have continuing going forward is to be able to change in, in your generation or the, uh, you know, the millenniums in terms of what our brand means. If we continue to be known as Midas Muffler and nobody needs a muffler, we're probably not gonna be around that long. So as we continue to grow as auto service experts or as total car care experts, and if you ask your generation, what does Midas do? A lot of people will say oil changes. Um, and you know we want the full service aspect to be known. And it's really a challenge when you have ingrained a brand so strongly into the minds of the consumer of what it means to change what that means over time. And uh, while we still feel the Midas name has 92% you know, brand recognition, it's a first choice by many people. Um, when you ask them well, what do they do, it becomes a lesser amount of services. So it, it's, it's a continuing challenge for us. We're just happy that uh, we have the brand and that we actually have a package, as you described it, a way of doing business that we can instill in our franchise owners and support them on their entrepreneurial uh, adventures. 
terms of franchisees and then ask uh, Cassandra to comment at the end. Hi. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, Dairy Queen has been around since 1940, and the best thing, in my opinion, about being part of a franchise system is the strength of marketing that they give to us and our research and development and our, um, our headquarters up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They are so willing and ready to come out to our stores and give us any advice and guidance that we need. Uh, Dairy Queen is constantly evolving as do um, menus evolve artisan type sandwiches. You know, um, we had our Mr. Misty product, which some of you may not even know that name. You know it now as Arctic Rush. Dairy Queen is constantly evolving as as our as our customer base evolves, and um, luckily we have the marketing and the advertising of which we pay our franchise fees into that that help us get our name out there and get it known. Thank you. Do you have a question for me? Or? <laughs> what do you see as the advantages of being a part of a larger of a larger system, part of the franchise system, and what are the challenges you face um, that you face is, as part of that? Because after all, the alternative is always to set up an independent restaurant, an independent hotel chain, an independent car repair shop. Yeah, we, we started in the restaurant business in Charleston here. We, uh, we had uh, Yelp Crackers restaurant, which is way before your time, but now it's Stu's. It operates as a bar at night. Uh, we also have the Alamo Steakhouse, and those are, those are both independent uh, ownership uh, businesses. And about 17 years ago, we, went, we, we got into the uh, hotel business, which is franchise. It was a Holiday Inn Express, or it is. Um, and the, uh, the advantages of that is that the national advertising, um, the, the, the professionals that are, that are um, inspecting us, I would say, the people that help us to build the place, um, to design it, help pick out the materials, you know, they dictate primarily how you operate the business. And at times, you don't like someone telling you what to do, but other times, you have to realize that it makes the brand consistent. And like with our hotel, with the Holiday Inn, hopefully um, with, with the parent company watching over us, uh, our, our hotel is gonna be the exact same or as in good a shape as another hotel in another town or another city. And so if you come to like that brand, you like to stay at that hotel, You'll, you'll be comfortable going to another one in another town and get the same experience. Um, also with hotels, the big thing these days is the, uh, the, um, on, or the, uh, the credit system, the point system. And we get a lot of return customers because they're, they're getting uh, the bonus points that they can put toward uh, free hotel rooms when they go on vacations. Um, the consistency is really what helps with the franchise brand. Um, There's a wonderful quote that a, if a person serves a bad Danish or has a tough night in a hotel, bad mattress, noisy room, then that reflects on everyone in that chain. So there's an interdependence, an economic interdependence created by that shared brand. An independent chain is not, an independent restaurant, independent hotel is not necessarily based at independent repair shop. Cassandra. Um, I deal with franchises in two different ways, working for the Attorney General's office. The first way is that franchises that want to sell locations in Illinois have to come through my office and register first. So they have to put together a packet of information about the company, about its business model, about the folks that um, you know are going to be providing services for the franchise. 
So I supervise a group of folks that look over those information packets and make sure that all that information is in there. So the folks who are interested in buying a store or a unit in Illinois have as much information as, um, you know, as possible to compare and to make a choice and to know what they're getting into before they buy. The, the second part of my job is enforcement. And so I deal with the situations that have gone wrong. I have taken complaints from franchisees who have bought and didn't get um, what they thought they were going to get or didn't receive the services that they thought they were going to get and now are failing and struggling. So I see that problem side of it more probably than our, our other folks on the panel. But those are the two ways that I come into contact with franchising. Now have you seen some, uh, what, what do you see from your standpoint is that in terms of policy, in terms of employment, strengths of the franchise system? Because after all, as an agent of the state, you're interested in economic development. Sure, sure. I, I think that it's a, a very strong business model that helps a lot of folks start a business and get into business on their own. Um, so it can go wrong, or it can go right most of the time. Unfortunately, what I see are usually the problems of where it's gone wrong. And the focus, I think, of my office, the focus of everybody that's thinking about getting into franchising should be on getting information up front. Folks that research and know what they're getting into, that are prepared, um, you know, do really well. Um, folks who haven't researched and haven't gotten good advice and, you know, have invested and now are in a long-term contract, those are the folks that, that struggle. Now, these contracts go on for 20 years on average, just to name a number, and they're then renewed, so it is a long-term commitment. So since Cassandra's raised the point, let's ask our panel also what advice they would offer to someone who might be considering purchasing a franchise, and in particular, what type of due diligence they would recommend for their system and more generally. Uh, we'll start again with Daryl and work our way around. We have a pretty rigorous uh, due diligence process. Um, it involves, uh, you know, leaving out the financial qualification part that's done separately. But um, we engage from an operations standpoint, an interview, sort of similar to an employment interview for the franchisee to make sure that their mindset and their future is where we want it to be before we would say yes to uh, moving forward. We do, the document that uh, Cassandra had mentioned, we have a uniform offering circular or a franchise disclosure statement that we give out, which lists every one of our franchisees in it. We encourage them to randomly pick and call and engage an existing franchisee in a discussion of when they started, how has it gone, what has been your expectations, have they been met. Um, we then do an awful lot of uh, in-store training prior to them even being a franchisee. We encourage them to work in the store, get to know the environment. Um, our other franchisees offer that assistance to them. And then from that, we train them. It's a three-week course in Florida. Um, but the documents are a key there because we get them into their hands. There's waiting periods. We give them 14 days to read through the documents. We cannot sign anything with them until the 14 days has passed. There's 10-day waiting periods beyond that. So from the time it starts until the time they walk in and turn the, the key to their door, we're usually looking at four or five months of due diligence prior to um, starting that first day. And the ones that are prepared and, and understand the duration of time it takes are successful. Those that try to cut the corners and uh, skimp on their due diligence usually struggle on day one. So it, it, the due diligence is critical for us. For the International Dairy Queen system, um, we have, um, my, my family owns the Mattoon franchise, and we have a 10 mile radius within which we operate under that franchise agreement. That franchise agreement took place over 67 some years ago. My father was, when my father passed away three years ago, he was the third oldest franchisee in the system. So we pay. Our marketing and our advertising fees that we pay are based on a percentage, and you can imagine our percentage is quite low. So Dairy Queen right now may be offering those um, uh, mix, 
our, our mix that we get into the store, our Dairy Queen mix, we pay a percentage for each gallon. Those percentages now, I believe, are 6.25, mine are 4.1. So our, our percentages are quite low. That's the beauty of having a franchise that we've had for quite some time. Uh, we also pay on our, our beef that comes into the store our, um, that, that we get in. Dairy Queen has 61,000 units in 28 some states. When an individual is interested in opening up a Dairy Queen franchise or having a Dairy Queen franchise, I think those franchises now, I think they range anywhere from 25 to 35,000 is what the going rate for just a franchise is. Now, if you're wanting to build a new store, first of all, you contact Dairy Queen, you get information about their, um, their process, they will vet you. You have to have a net worth of at least $750,000. And then they, once they vet you, once they figure out what your business plan, what you would like, you know, where you would like to uh, put your store in, um, they have you uh, go to other locations and see those other locations. And you uh, turn in your plans and then they, they look over them very, very well. The, the process for Dairy Queen, if you were to start a brand new store from scratch, if you had the land, it will go a lot faster for you. It would probably be in underside of a year that you could get a franchise, you could start up a store. If you didn't have the property and you wanted to locate in a certain area, Dairy Queen would help you try and find that property and then your process may take a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, the big thing about franchisors is they don't want you to fail. So they want to make sure that you've got enough money, enough backing, enough knowledge um, to make it work. And when we opened our first, uh, when we built our first hotel, we were placed in touch with, with a franchise salesman. And he, he kind of walked us through it, he showed us some properties. And when we came up with a couple of pieces of land that we wanted to build on, they kind of did their own feasibility study. And you know, with, with some restaurants, it may be 40,000, you need a, a, a town of 40,000 to even have a, a, a restaurant. Um, but with a hotel, it's, it's a transient business. Uh, if, you're, if you're close to a highway, that can help. But they do their own feasibility study, and they say, you know what, I don't think this is a real good spot for you. And that's what happened to us. Uh, we picked a place out in Mattoon, and this was 17 years ago, before most of those hotels were built. And oh. they came back and said, you know, it's, it's just not a good time to build in Mattoon. I think we can find you a lot better property. And so we just kind of kept in touch with the franchise, with the, with the salesman, and he finally came up with a property up in the Chicago area. And we went up and looked, and you know, we didn't think it was that great of a place, but it was right near the highway. He said it was, it was just, it's, 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 a, it's just a, not a money grab, but it's just, it's, it's guaranteed to do well. And so we brought in an independent uh, 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 analyst to do a feasibility study, and he even agreed with, with the Holiday Inn uh, franchise salesman. And so we built our, our hotel there, and we've been very successful. Now also with, with franchisees, they're, they're constantly coming in to inspect us to make sure that we're keeping up our standards. Um, you know, we do pay a, a percentage. It's, it's, uh, it's about 6%, I think, of our gross goes right to uh, the Holiday Inn uh, to uh, payment for, for commissions. Um, but that buys us national advertising. Um, and also the fact that um, with, with these, like I mentioned before, with the, uh, with the honor system or the point system, um, there's a lot of people that will stay with us because they're building up these points to get free rooms. Um, so it, it, it's really a strong base where if, if, if we had just an independent hotel, you, you drive through small towns and, and they've got a little uh, mom and pop place. If you, if you see, you don't see a lot of cars there and they are struggling. Um, it, 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 it helps to have that umbrella over you to protect you, I guess, or to help you to, and if you do have problems, they, they do come and uh, they, will, they will come and they will, they will analyze them and they will try to walk you through them and help you with them. But just to also amplify a little bit further, the 
the, obviously the Dairy Queen's uh, the Dairy Queen's magic ice cream is purchased from Dairy Queen Incorporated, and of course that's a delicious and proprietary formula. Many restaurants and restaurant chains have a very small quantity of purchases from the franchisor. The franchisor is making his or her money from the royalty of building up the brand and building up that production uh, technology, that production system, that recipe. Um, so, so, so just so you're aware of that, and the locations are typically the responsibility of the franchisee with considerable advice and counsel from the franchisor as a general rule. Is that fair to say? When you said location, that, that makes me think. We had, um, my father, when he started in Dairy Queen, we had a small little walk-up DQ. And then he moved to a second location Again, a small little walk-up DQ. Well, then back in um, 1983, uh, 82, my father was itching to have a second store. We took family vote. There's five of us in the family. Um, three of us said no. Two said yes. And then my dad said, okay, well, I'm the deciding factor. And I say yes. So he built the store anyway. So. Um, he had to go up to Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is where our headquarters were, and he had to go in with a business plan to Dairy Queen. He had to go in, he went in armed with um, street counts. He contacted the state of Illinois. They did street counts on the location that he wanted. And he argued his point, and he ended up winning. Because Dairy Queen did not want two locations in a town at the time that was was less than thirty thousand. I mean that's just unheard of. But uh, we did win our case, and um, it's been quite quite good to our families. How did you decide? Uh, obviously, for Moni, in Moni's case, it wasn't a choice. It was a choice by her father, I suppose. But how did you decide that you wanted to be a part of this industry? What, rec what recommendation would you offer to someone choosing, if they wish to enter the franchise business, how would they choose which industry to, per to enter? How would they choose which chain to purchase? Uh, what would you advise? First of all, I think you have to, if you are wanting to get in a franchise business, you need to think of where your strengths lie. Are your strengths, uh, you know, I mean, are you good working with your hands? Or, you know, do you like being in the food industry? Or you need to stop and think of where your interest lies. And then get out there and research whatever franchises might be tailored to what your, where your strengths are. Um, and then you need to know that if you are going to run your own business, you will have to work. And I'm not saying, I mean, depending on what your store hours were, I mean, you need to be in your business. You need to be seen in your business. And I personally think it's very important to be, for me, to be working behind that counter. I want to be, I want to be flipping burgers, and I want to be, you know, blending blizzards just alongside all, all the employees and our team members that we have in the store. Your customers want to see that. But um, you need to be willing to know that you're going to work. And then you also need to know that if you're going to be part of a franchise system, so to speak, you're going to have Big Brother. And Big Brother will always be looking over your shoulder gently and then there will be times when it will be uh, suggestions that you don't like. And you will still have to go along with them because your contract agreement may be written as such. Um, we are lucky in the Dairy Queen system, about 20 years ago, a Dairy Queen operators co-op came in. And it was a very, very, very contentious time with the Dairy Queen system. But that co-op, the reason why the co-op was formed was when we bought our cups, when we bought our spoons, when we bought our napkins, we had no choice but to buy the cups, the spoons, the napkins that Dairy Queen system 
sold to us. So we, as franchisees, were concerned and nervous that, oh, you know, they've got a, a case count here of 5,000, and that case count of, you know, 16 ounce cups is going to cost us $50. Gee, I wonder if Eli Lilly can produce those cups at a much cheaper rate. And if we're using solo cup, wonder if Eli Lilly can produce them at a cheaper rate. So that is part of the reason why this Dairy Queen co-op was formed. A bunch of, actually it was, a, it was a lawyer that worked for, he was the president of International Dairy Queen, and he, um, he formed his own co-op and he left Dairy Queen. And it keeps, you have a choice whether you pay into this co-op, which we do, and then it was a long court battle, and the court system cited for the Dairy Queen operators, and they said Dairy Queen franchise system cannot monopolize pricing on products that go in your stores. <laughs> so that was beneficial to us as um, that was beneficial to us as store owners and franchisees. And now, very luckily, <laughs> the franchise does recognize the co-op and they whenever the franchise like comes out with a new product they have to share those specs with the research and development that the DQ co-op has um, in place so now we have a choice on where we buy from I think if you'll remember back there I don't know if it was the Wendy system but there was a franchise system that went through this same problem within the last 10 or 15 years that we battled 20, 25 years ago. Do you remember, Dr. Michaels, what that system was? Because there was a system that went through the same deal. It was, I think it was Wendy's, although I'm not. And there was also a case of an oil change uh, group that was in the southeast. Um, when, when it was all said and done I, in the court yeah. system, um, in order to make things a little bit more fair, the judge basically said, first of all, Dairy Queen, Inter International Dairy Queen, has to share all their specs within a timely manner, and he said, you know, and they laid out the sure. the time frame, and then we we got something like four million dollars worth of free advertising as a system. So it worked out to our benefit. We we took a, a radically different approach as a franchisor within the automotive service industry. So much of our Commodity is is technical skills, and uh, that's so individualized. We have a requirement that they have to complete certain ASC certifications or certain training to be classified as a brake technician or whatever. But all of the products sold in a minor store, while we used to manufacture back when we did exhaust, we've been out of the manufacturing and, and distribution business for 20 years. But we have the right to approve the products that they sell. So we could keep a control on the quality that is installed from each individual shop. If they want to buy Chinese brake pads for $3 a piece, um, they can't. We do not allow that. And that would be a default of the franchise and something we would enforce because we don't want inferior product going on a vehicle with the minus name on the invoice. So we took a different approach to that, but uh, I've seen that frequently over and over again and our language is approved minus product in terms of that. And that's probably the more common arrangement on the whole. We have, we have approved listing as well. Cassandra, someone has asked the question, uh, given that this is a, a legal relationship, who handles the legal relationships for the franchisee and does, uh, does the franchisor ever help with the legal, with the legal issues? Um, well, I'm not sure what's meant by legal issues. There, th that is part of the drawback of a franchisee when you get into business with a franchisor is, is franchisor has a lot of lawyers working for them. They have developed a contract. There's very little negotiation. But I shouldn't say very little. There is some negotiating that can happen over the terms of that contract. But the franchisee, um, the prospect is in, you know, much less of a bargaining position than the franchisor. So I think it's very important that franchisees hire 
a lawyer to look over their documents, hire an accountant, hire somebody with some expertise to look over that information and to help them out, to look over those contracts, make sure that those terms, you know, are favorable to them and make sure that, more importantly, that the franchisee understands what they're getting into because these are very long-term agreements. And hopefully, even more than a long-term agreement, the, that initial investment that folks have made is so great that that franchisee is looking to renew that contract, right? They don't want to get in for just one term. They want this usually to be a long-term relationship because they put a lot in up front. They bought equipment. Um, they bought a lot of, you know, expenses up front that need to pay off for them. So I don't know if that answers the question. I think it does. And I'll just add the simple fact that uh, all the business law you need to know, if you're in business, you need a lawyer. And a discussion. It is so true. There it is. is so true. Almost all the problems I see in my office could have been avoided if folks had hired a lawyer, had hired an accountant. These are legal documents. And a professional okay. lawyer and not yes. someone you found at the law, you know, who's two years out of law school but didn't quite finish, or a friend of Cousin Bo's. Yeah, you can't do it online. Right. <laughs> do not Google. Right. Right. Um, we've, uh, we've been asked, do you feel like your own boss? And uh, do you feel like your own boss? Do you have a, a place for the creativity that is Jim, the genius that is Moni, uh, and the, the, the talent that might be Daryl? Absolutely, you're your own boss until they tell you to do something different. <laughs> there are times when, when we have to do a, a remodel. Uh, they, uh, the Hampton Inn, for an example, um, they wanted us to change our breakfast uh, lobby and our, uh, what we serve for breakfast. And they basically gave us so much time, uh, about a year, to uh, come up with a plan and to re uh, renovate the entire breakfast area to their uh, standards. Um, at that end, it, it was at uh, probably cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to do it. Um, luckily, the brand generates enough money for us, and we saved the money, so we had the money to do it. But at times, there are times when you just you know you feel like you're just working for someone else. But it does work out. It's it's a short-term bad feeling, um, but but you are basically on your own until they, they come by and, and inspect you and, and say you need to do something different. I think one thing that Jim had said earlier is the franchisor's franchisor's goal to make them successful for them to be successful. We don't want franchisees to fail. You know, it's not good for them, it's not good for us, it's not good for our consumers. So everything we do is geared towards a win-win situation. Um, sometimes the legal aspect of the contract doesn't necessarily look that way, but there's protections of the brand and the system, and there's protections for the individual. And so those two have to be matched together because you can't have a, a one-off independent operator running a Midas franchise because that's the weakest link in the chain, as you just mentioned. So there's, there's usually when you sit down with reasonable people, you can come up with you know, reasonable solutions to the compromise. Um, our franchise doesn't change. I mean, if you say I don't want it to say that, it's a registered document with every state in the country. We cannot just randomly change that contract. It has to be re-registered in order for that to happen. It has to be applied across our franchise base. So we don't change our franchise contract at all. Um, we will do riders, amendments, and things like that, but it's only in the best interest of the system, and the system being the franchisee and franchisor. I just want to add one more thing. Uh, this, this big renovation we did for the breakfast, it, it's very successful. We never thought it would fly, and it's, it's got a community table. It's just, it's just, it turned out great. You should hear the discussions with McDonald's doing breakfast all day right now. <laughs> <laughs> Being in business is a lot of problem solving on a daily basis, and some of those problems are obviously are structured within the franchise agreement, but a significant part of the problem that a franchisee would face is the challenge of marketing, how, and of course what works in Mattoon might not work in Galveston, Texas, Another part of it is uh, supply, particularly labor and training. Where do you find people? 
One of the best stories I ever heard from a franchisee was describing the question of how do you find people, if you're merry maids, to clean houses, people who are willing to clean houses and are honest enough to clean houses. The Pittsburgh franchisee found a secret. He went to Catholic church and attended daily mass. And he talked to all the women that he saw at, at the mass. And afterwards, he, if they were interested, he invited them to come work for him. Why? Well, because many of these women were either widowed or their husbands were retired steel workers and they were, had been homemakers all their lives. They were used to this kind of work. They even enjoyed it. And the fact they were church suggested they might be honest. Now, this same strategy for human resources isn't necessarily going to work in other parts of the country. But those are the kind of problems that a business person has to solve. Where are you going to find talented workers? And how are you going to find interested customers? So I'd be curious to hear from the panel if they've had some good experiences on either identifying good labor or identifying good customers. Identifying good labor, that's a tough one. That, I think as a business owner, that's probably your biggest battle is getting getting employees that will clean up and show up and do the job as the, just the job description entails and as they have been trained to do. Um, Dairy Queen has a lot of fail safes in place. I mean, we have, we have trainers. I have invested in that training program. I have a trainer in my store. I believe in that. Um, they give us suggestions on um, where to look for employees. The help is there with the system on how to staff your store. You just have to be willing to buy into it and, um, and actually heed some of their advice. We're, um, as a franchisor, and Cassandra and I was talking about it a little while ago, are very concerned with the most current Browning and Ferris ruling that has associated franchisors with franchisees as associate employees. Today, we've taken all hiring, um, uh, compensation, job roles out of our policy manuals because the suit was filed, the suit was won, and McDonald's is the one that was targeted, was shown as every franchisee's employee can now be an employee of McDonald's Corporation. McDonald's can be responsible for unemployment insurance, workers' comp insurance, all litigation with past employees. So until this is brushed over, we have no coaching at all for employee recruitment, employee staffing models, or job descriptions. Ouch. It, it really takes a, a huge dimension of franchising out of the uh, business model. Uh, a student has asked uh, a question about creating new franchises. The student has asked in particular about whether he, whether our panel thinks there might be an opportunity in the pro sound industry. I would be uh, lying if I said I understood what the pro sound industry is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but perhaps I, let's, let's turn it this way and say, what do you think would be the ingredients for someone who wished to start a franchise chain and what type of success that might, uh, might require? And if anyone has, a, from their vantage point, has seen a, an attractive concept outside the auto repair, restaurant, hotel area. Well, I'll jump in and talk about that because I, I do see the problems. So I have a unique perspective on what makes a good system. I, I don't know what a pro stuff is either. But, you know, if you have an idea and the first step is to set up a store, to set up a unit and see if it is successful. And pick something that you're excited about and passionate about. I think that that is very important. When you think about expanding that into a franchise, 
a franchise has three parts by definition. You're going to charge somebody a fee to buy in to sell, you know, to, to own one of your stores. They're going to use your name. You're going to put your name on it. And you're going to provide them a marketing plan to how they're going to run their business. So that's how we define a franchise. So when you start thinking about expanding and selling to other people who may have experience with ProSound, who may not, um, you really need to get some good advice. You need to get a lawyer who deals with franchise and start putting together the information that's required on your system and um, your finances and all, all of that really needs to be put together. But the first step is really to make sure you have a store that's running successfully because you're going to need to train folks, you're going to need to show them a model, they're going to want to see, you know, some data on how your store is performing and, and data on how you think, why it is you think that that store could perform, that model could perform well elsewhere in a different region, in a different market. So those are my two cents. Anybody else? It is worth pointing out that franchising is a fabulous mechanism to leverage the service economy. I would argue that franchising is as important to the service economy as venture capital is to the tech economy. That's a bold claim. I think it's supported by the evidence. So as you come up with a good idea, there is an opportunity to build a business around that and to use the talent of individual franchisees to assist you. Remember that talent is in many cases financial, it's managerial, and it's locational. It's knowing that the 19th Street in Mattoon makes a difference as opposed to, say, 18th Street or 17th Street. Whatever that may be. It's a way to use other people's talent. Daryl doesn't know where every auto repair shop should be all over the country, but he's getting people who do. So a franchise chain, setting up a franchise chain, allows you to leverage those three distinct competencies, those three of the local talent, the local franchisee. It brings a lot of resources to bear on the genius that is your sandwich shop, that is your pro sound operation. So. I would add one more comment on that. I found it interesting when you said the 20 mile geographical protection area. Um, you know, and that's one thing to look at when you're looking at various franchises because we, we give no geographical protection. It's your, your geographical protection is your address. And the reason for that is the density shifts in population so if we gave geographical protection um, and all of a sudden it grew and grew and grew 30 years from now and we could have a second store there, the franchise would restrict that. So we don't do that. Although historically, and you can look throughout the Midas records, that we do not cannibalize our, our franchisee sales. You know, it's not good for us, it's not good for them, it goes back to that win-win situation. Um, but, uh, you know, the one sound, um, the one franchise that is picking up, and it's new in the last 10 years, is uh, wineries. You know, it hadn't been there in the past. You know, you saw microbreweries coming up all over the place. But, you know, Cooper Hawk Winery decided that they could grow much quicker with their controls and their brand if they franchised. So they're going <laughs> to, and they're going to continue that, you know, so that, that was a, one that just came onto the spotlight and, and grew dramatically within 10 years. That, that 10 mile radius is something that my dad had put in the agreement, just as he also put in his agreement that no blood relative other than a Roytech, which is what my maiden name is, would ever um, be listed on that franchise. That's created some um, legal, <laughs> little, some fa little legal family headaches. But. That was my father's intention, and we know what his intent was, and we aim to honor that as long as we possibly can. Students asked, how does a franchise chain innovate? And what does innovation mean in the context of your businesses? I, I would only comment on that, on our innovation is within the realm of our uh, our core competencies, which is automotive repair. And we did start off as a muffler place. 80% of our business was exhaust. We went into brakes and went 50-50 brakes exhaust. We would never touch an oil change back then. Um, but as times change, and you talk about a changing environment, look at the cars today. You know, before you used to be able to limp them into a repair shop. 
Now a module goes out and you don't start that car. So there's more computer controls, white coat type technicians needed in the future in the automotive industry than there ever has been. Uh, a backyard mechanic could make a good mechanic in a uh, uh, repair shop. In the future, that's not going to be the case. It's going to be a highly skilled, uh, professionally trained individual that can repair the cars that will be necessary. So that's our innovation. Our innovation is technology. We have to continue to technologically advance not only our people, but our equipment. Today, a scanner to plug into your car to tell you what that check engine light runs around $10,000. So when somebody says it's 1995 to check that light, you say, wait, you're just going to plug that in and um, give me a code. Well, you know, it's a $10,000 piece of equipment that the franchisee had to invest in in order to get that code. And that's just scratching the surface of what technology is going to look like in our industry going forward. A lot of changes in the, uh, the hotel industry, some of them come from the, the, from the franchisor, but a lot of them come from the franchisees. Just, you know, way back when, one franchisee decided, let's have breakfast. Let's, let's serve some breakfast to our customers. Maybe we can get some more people in. And that just grew, and then it became uh, basically a common, uh, commonality for, for hotels, especially the, uh, the express hotels, to offer free breakfast. So I think a, a lot of changes over time have come from ideas from the franchisees. I would agree with that. Our, our best practices have come from our franchisees. That's where, that's where it starts, that's where it uh, takes place. I'd have to say Dairy Queen's a little bit different in that regard. Um, our, our probably our biggest um, Innovation came in 1985, a guy by the name of Sam Temperato in the St. Louis area, who was a territory operator, owned 20-some Dairy Queen, so he was a territory operator. Uh, as a Dairy Queen system, the system in Texas, in the entire state of Texas, they somewhat seceded year, eons ago from, the, from international Dairy Queen. So Dairy Queens in Texas are a little bit different. The signage is different. Um, there are 66 Dairy Queens in the state of Texas, and they are all run as their own separate territory. But our biggest innovation took place in 1985 when Sam Temperato came up with the Blizzard concept. And uh, other than that, every single one of our ideas comes out of Dairy Queens research and development and that is in, located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's uh, Dairy Queen's in a high-rise building, and it literally looks like a, uh, you gotta have pass cards to get in there. People going in and out are in, um, you know, white jackets, and you know, it's like it's, it's highly top secret in there. We can't tell you what goes on in there, we gotta kill you, type of thing, so. Um, and, then the other, uh, the other mechanism that Dairy Queen uses in that research and development is they do have um, focus groups that come in and do taste testing. But other than that, it, 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 everything takes place in Minneapolis for us. I'm going to ask two more questions. Um, or actually, I'm going to ask two more sets of questions. So the students have asked, what does it take financially to be a franchisee, to what type of expense are we looking at in your system or in your experience? And how does one obtain funding to open a franchise? Well, at least within the, in the Midas world, um, we have uh, net worth parameters that we work with, anywhere from 200 to 300,000 in net worth, uh, liquidity of 100,000, <clears> and uh, after that, that's for, that's for one store that does not include real estate or land because that's the individual's responsibility. If we're gonna do real estate and land, um, you're looking at a completely different measure of liquidity and net worth. Um, we have a, a completely different structure when it looks at uh, multiple shop owners. We have some owners with 120 stores, some with 50 stores. Half of our system are single shop operators. So the liquidity there, most, we encourage our people to work with local banks. 
always attempt to work with your local bank first because that's where your gonna relationship's gonna be after the fact. You're gonna have that relationship. Obviously, there's uh, SBA loans that can, that can happen. We do not do any financing within Midas. We're not a bank. You know, our core competency is franchising. So we encourage them to establish their local relationships, um, and if they need the SBA to guarantee their loan, to work through the bank to get that to happen. Um, when we, when we uh, built our first hotel, uh, we needed about 20% down. And uh, the graces of the, uh, the local bank to uh, back us and to trust that we could survive. Um, since then, uh, over, over the years, you pay down on that mortgage. And when we, when we went to look for our second site or our second hotel, we had enough equity in the first hotel that we could use, basically take a second loan against that hotel, and that was the down payment for the second hotel. And that's how we got the third hotel. We just, over, over time, we'd, we'd pay those uh, mortgages down, and we could get the second mortgages. So it's, it's that first property is the tough one uh, to get going. And you know, that first hotel was probably $4 million to build, so we had to come down with 20% of that, so that's almost a million bucks. Um, we had been in uh, the restaurant business before then, so we used that, we mortgaged that property with a second mortgage. But it's just, you have to get one property, you have to just, uh, now uh, with the Dairy Queen, I don't know how much a property costs to build. Uh, a million and a half, two million dollars? Yeah. Yeah, so you need, uh, for that, you need, you know, at least 20% down, and, and some banks probably want more than that. And it's fair to say, obviously, this is determined in part by the efficient scale of any given operation. A hotel is a one kind of scale. A water repair shop is a different kind of scale. A restaurant is a third kind of scale. And a pro shop, a pro sound operation, is probably uh, different as well. So part of that is determined by the nature of the industry you enter. Research has shown that a lot of people choose an industry first and then choose a franchise chain within it as a mechanism. So you start with that interest and also that understanding of the level of financing you're going to require, and then you choose a competitor within that area. I want to read this last question from the student, and I want to read it word for word. Why should I invest? in such a risky leap of faith, crossing the line in the sand operation as a franchise, rather than punching a clock for a big company. Why should I do this? Money or something else? Did, was the answer on the back of that card? <laughs> um, I, I think it's purely drive. It's drive to be successful, drive to control a destiny. Um, money obviously has a, has a factor in it. You know, as punching the clock, um, we're sometimes limited on our upside. Uh, as owning a business and driving your passion to own that business and executing that business plan, you know, flawlessly, as I would say, your upside is not limited. You know, you're able to go from one, two, three hotels to maybe 30, 40 hotels. So the, you, you seem to be less limited. <laughs> you're, not, you're not enjoying that one, right? I, I just brought a 29-year-old from four, four minor shops to uh, 35 minor shops. So we have, uh, it's, it's all in drive and passion. And where they don't see there's a limit, they want to uh, continue that upward mobility. Is the mic on? I'm sorry. You, you are your own boss. That, that is the great part about it. Um, you absolutely have to have a stellar work ethic. You have got to get in there and bust your butt. And um, the company will, they want you to succeed. By all means, they want you to be successful. And they will go after you if they want you to open a second location. I have had a similar situation. However, 
I own the store on 19th Street. My brother runs the store on Charleston Avenue. We both have totally different, um, we both have totally different views about our businesses and we both run them totally different from one another. And if you walk in both stores, you will notice both stores are considerably different. My husband and I just opened in, well, our grand opening was in August. We have totally renovated our location at on 19th Street. When we signed up to do this renovation, it is the latest and greatest uh, model of store model that Dairy Queen has put out. All Dairy Queens going forward will have to look somewhat similar to our location. And um, it wasn't easy for us financially to do that. We, because of land values and Matt too, were so darn low. Luckily, we had been in Dairy Queen for, you know, 20 some plus years and had built up our equity and that gave us a good base because we had to have 20% down to get that loan. But then we also, my husband had, my husband is a building contractor. So it was somewhat of a no brainer that, wow, that'd be a good thing for us to do was go remodel our store because our store definitely needed remodeled. And of course, I hired Sheehan Construction to do it. So um, he, we put a lot of set sweat equity into it. I could never work for someone else. Uh, I, I'd rather work 100 hours a week for myself than work for someone else for 10 hours. Um, when we first got into the business, and this isn't really franchise, it's just owning a business. Uh, when we bought crackers, uh, my partner and I bought crackers, I went to my dad to borrow money because we didn't have any money. And the other side thing is you can always look for a business that uh, owner financing, uh, contract sales, where you don't have to go through a bank uh, at the beginning. You can, you can get established, know what kind of money you're making, and then maybe you've got a basis to go to a bank for a loan to buy out that contract. But uh, when, when we bought uh, Crackers, um, it was a contract sale from, from the owner. Uh, we impressed on him that uh, you know, we, we, could, we could do a good job, and, and, and he came up with a price. And uh, my partner and I had to come up with uh, $30,000 a piece. And so I went to my dad to, to see if I could borrow the money. And he said, why did we put you through school? I was an engineer by trade. And he tried to do everything to dissuade me that night before. And I was kind of heartbroken, you know, that you know, he wasn't going to lend me the money. And the next morning at breakfast, he said, I had a family to support. I always wanted to go into my own business. And I just couldn't do it because, you know, we had, I had you know, a wife and, and five kids. So it, he wrote me a check that next morning. So it's pretty cool. I guess I'll just close by saying everyone in this world wants to make a difference. And when you're your own boss, you have the advantage of seeing that difference that you make in the lives of your customers. I'm sure that each of our panelists could tell us the story of smiles and successes that they've brought directly or indirectly. A, a person who's uh, stranded, whose vehicle is moving, a person who's desperate for a good night's sleep before the big sales call the following morning, or the fun of watching the state champion baseball team come in and have a round of blizzards. So that's a motivation that you won't necessarily see in the larger enterprises and larger companies. So with that, I would like to, first of all, thank our fabulous panel. I would like to invite you to visit with them some more if they have the time, and so that they, you can uh, get your other questions answered. And I thank you so much for attending. Have a good evening.